Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are continuing our journey through French rifle development. And today we are taking a look at the model of 1892 Berthier Carbine. So in 1890, the French military had adopted this guy as the standard cavalry carbine. And they made a whole bunch of them, and it was all good. Um, however, there were some other branches of the French military that also needed carbines, and they weren't quite up to adopting that cavalry carbine. This was, these were groups like uh, artillery, crews, uh, drivers, messengers, um, engineers, basically guys who had auxiliary duties that made it less than convenient for them to carry a full-size Lebel rifle. They also needed some sort of carbine. And it took two years, but ultimately the French military adopted basically this exact same cavalry carbine, just with a bayonet added to it, and that became the artillery model. Uh, in this case it was called the Artillery Musketoon, or Mosqueton, and they would end up making a lot more of these than of the cavalry guns, because they in fact had a lot more troops who were in a position to use something like this. So, mechanically, in pretty much every way, this is identical to the 1890 cavalry carbine, except the stock has been cut a little bit shorter, and it's set up to use a bayonet, because these guys, engineers, artillery crew, etc., they were on foot and they were presumably needed some sort of bladed weapon to go on the end of the carbine. So, uh, in total, these were well, these were then manufactured by the same two arsenals that were doing the other carbines, Châtellerault and Saint-Étienne, and uh, in total they would manufacture about 384,000 of these by the time World War I actually started. So, way more than the cavalry carbines. Uh, once the war started they kind of kicked production into high gear, and by the time they stopped making these, they'd have a total of 675,000 of them. So, really quite a lot of carbines. Now, as the war went on, there were some flaws with these carbines that started to become evident. And there's a lot of questions about, well, about these flaws. Primarily, why were the French using a three-round clip? Wasn't it pretty obvious well before World War I that more than three rounds was possible? After all, the Germans had adopted a five-round uh, rifle all the way back in 1888? Well, there are a couple explanations for that. First off, this wasn't intended to be a frontline infantry weapon. That was the Lebel, and it held eight rounds in its magazine, which is three more than the German rifles. This was really supposed to be kind of a backup weapon. You didn't anticipate your artillery crewmen were going to be fighting in, you know, hot infantry combat with their carbines. They were supposed to be there using artillery. Same with drivers and messengers. The engineers weren't the ones expected to be delivering, you know, the sustained primary infantry fire. So they didn't necessarily need as many rounds as the standard infantry rifle. And it wasn't what, what happened in World War I wasn't really anticipated, and that was the carbine becoming a primary combat weapon, because it was so much handier, especially in trench warfare, than this very long Lebel rifle. So on the one hand they didn't really see that need coming, uh, on the other uh, on a second second note, uh, they also had this. You know, the responsibilities of military arms development don't end at the infantry rifle or the support carbine. There was a lot of other stuff that they were working on. Artillery, machine guns, and then all manner of other logistical things. Trucks. Let's replace horses with motorized vehicles in the military. All of these things take resources that could potentially be given to small arms development. So once they had a carbine, it was developed for the cavalry, all right, by 1892 we realize this will work just fine, it'll get the job done, we'll just adopt it and use it, and then once the war starts it becomes much more difficult to actually change it, to update it, and put a lot of energy into designing something that's different. Now, despite that uh, that level of difficulty in, in changing mid-war, they did do just that. So in early in the spring of 1916, uh, the French War Ministry put out a request for a number, basically an update package to the 1892 carbines, and that would become the model of M16, or the, the uh, model, the modification of M16, 1916, and we will cover that in the next video, and that's going to be a big one. There's a lot of stuff going on at that point, and that's when the French would really update this from a pre-war support weapon to a frontline combat weapon. So we'll touch on that in the next video. Uh, the other thing, since that's pretty much all there is to tell you about the 1892s, um, 
and you can see it pretty well. We'll take a closer look at these so you can see the markings and how they're going to change a little bit. And then the other thing we are going to do is take a look at the bayonets. Because of course one of the defining characteristics, the whole reason they had this as a distinct weapon from the 1890 carbines was that it needed a bayonet. So let's take a look at the bayonets. There were three different versions and we have examples of all three here to show you. So the first thing I need to do is point out that I actually left out a, uh, a whole batch of these guns, and that is the 1890 Gendarmerie carbine. So before this was actually adopted for the artillery and the support troops, the version here with a shortened stock and a bayonet lug uh, was actually developed right off of the 1890 carbine and issued to Gendarmerie, or uh, basically national police. Uh, they were uh, running about on both foot and on horse and did have the need for a bayonet. Uh, despite being a police force, they were subject to uh, basically being called up as a military reserve, uh, so that is why they needed a military style carbine with a bayonet, despite being police. Now, there were only a small number of those uh, guns made, something like, I believe they actually ordered like 44,000, but then decided that they only actually needed about half of those, and so uh, the rest were actually issued out as artillery carbines, because other than one marking on the receiver, they really are identical to these artillery carbines. So speaking of that marking on the receiver, here it is. Uh, we have the arsenal that manufactured the gun, in this case San and Tien. And then we have the model. This is an, a Model, uh, M-O-D-E-L-E, -E, 1892. On the Gendarmerie carbines this would be identical, except it would say 1890 and have a bayonet lug. So we've got that. We then have, as with the previous guns, we have a serial number here on the barrel. Uh, there is no serial on the receiver, it was considered unnecessary. We then have steel suppliers and inspector marks. On the opposite side of the barrel shank we have the location where the barrel was manufactured, so M-A-S here is Manufacture de Armes de Saint-Étienne, the S is for Saint-Étienne. Um, at this point the arsenals were making their own barrels, but there would be a period in World War I coming up uh, where they would be using barrels produced by other companies, and that's when you'll start to see other letters replacing that S on barrels. So that's something to keep in mind for the future. And then of course we have the barrel manufacture date, which on this gun is 1893. Next up, on the right side of the stock we have a roundel, a uh, stamp in the wood, and this indicates not the date of manufacture, but the date of actual final military acceptance. So in the middle it's MA, manufactured arms, um, and then on the top we have the month. This one is November or November of 1893 down here. This is something that is often worn away on French rifles, but uh, it's really ideal if you're a collector to find guns that have these round L's nice and intact and still legible. And for the historian it provides a good um, additional data point, because this tells you when the gun actually went into service. So in some cases parts were manufactured and they may have sat around in a warehouse for a while before being allocated and being actually assembled. Uh, this gives you that, that final proof of when the gun was complete and done. We have the standard sling configuration here. This would be typical for, oh boy, they're going to have this sort of sling attachment for many decades to come. Uh, we have a ring on the front. And in this case we have a rotating uh, sling swivel on the bottom. Now on some of these guns, like we saw in the cavalry carbines earlier, you'll have a bar on the side, but because this was to be issued to foot troops, this was considered the preferred method of sling attachment. We also have the clearing rod here in a slot on the side of the stock. This is not for cleaning, as I mentioned with the, the cavalry carbines. This is actually there for knocking out a stuck case, should you get a case that sticks in the chamber. Um, it is threaded right here at the end so that it slides into this slot, it's held in place by the front band here, and then it's threaded into the receiver so that it doesn't come loose when you're shooting. Now this particular one is a reproduction rod. Originally these guns would have had rods that were serial numbered, serial, serial number matched to the rest of the gun. Uh, it is not that uncommon to find these rods missing, unfortunately, and uh, this particular 1892 carbine was missing its rod. So there are reproductions available on eBay. They're, as you can see, they're quite nice reproductions. Um, they're pretty easily distinguishable from, from originals because the reproductions don't have serial numbers on them, and they are way shinier than an original rod would be. There are three other places where you will find serial numbers, that being the bolt handle, the stock, and the bottom of the trigger guard slash magazine well assembly. 
These were all issued with bent bolt handles, and that was standard for the carbines. Um, in fact, up until 1915, there was no straight bolt handle model of a Berthier. So, three round end block clip, as we saw with the cavalry carbine. So, nothing new there. You may be familiar with the famous uh, French Rosalie bayonet. That's the very long uh, spike bayonet for the Lebel rifle. Well, the Berthiers did not use that, uh, with the exception of the Gendarmerie carbines, which did actually have a spike bayonet. Those are quite rare today, and I don't have an example to show you. However, the vast majority of uh, the Berthier carbines would use one of these three patterns of bayonet. And they're all interchangeable. They were just, uh, these three show the, the process of development, the changes in manufacture over the course of production. So we have a first pattern, a second pattern, and a third pattern. In general, this is a, a blade bayonet. It's got a big deep fuller in it, and it's also kind of distinctive for having this little cutout. So that cutout was added in 1898, and it was done to better retain the bayonet in its scabbard. I can't really get a good view inside to show you, but on each side of the scabbard there's a little rivet here at the back, and there's actually a bent piece of sheet metal that extends into the scabbard and uh, basically holds in this notch on either side of the blade, and that just prevents the blade from coming out. So our three main variants here, this was of course introduced with the rifle in the very beginning, and then the second pattern here was introduced in 1912, and the reason that they changed to this was that these bayonets didn't always fit on the rifles quite tightly enough, so what they did was actually extend the muzzle ring back just about an eighth of an inch, you know, a couple millimeters back. So you can see the difference right there. The first pattern just comes straight up uh, from where the uh, grips are attached. The second pattern extends backward just a little bit. And these are both using a Bakelite type of grip. Um, and then we have the major change of the third pattern here, which is they stopped extending the quillion all the way around. Now you might expect this to be a fairly early war thing, uh, but it actually wasn't. This wasn't done until like September of 1918, uh, very, very late in the war. Uh, and actually we have good evidence to show that, aside from just the documents that say it, uh, on this particular bayonet, which the serial number is pretty worn down, I don't think I can get a good camera angle on it, but this is a, a bayonet with a serial number of AB, uh, and then 59,000 and change. So these bayonets were serialized to their rifles, the serial numbers are right here on the quillions, and this particular one was made for a rifle, or made in, uh, 1918. In fact, fairly late in 1918, and it still has the full quillion. So that supports the existing documentation, which does say that these cut-down third pattern bayonets weren't done until very late in the war. Um, in fact, the official designation for these bayonets wasn't even uh, really put into documentation until 1925. So this is something that's more post-war than late war. Now, as for attachment to the carbines, these Berthier bayonets have a spring-loaded release button right here. There is a little locking bar right there in the base of the bayonet. This is different from the Lebel bayonet. The Lebel bayonet actually has a locking collar that goes right behind the muzzle ring. On the Berthier, we have a little hook in a bayonet lug right there, and that's actually going to insert itself into the pommel, like so and snap on like that. And then it just kind of pushes the cleaning rod just slightly out of the way. Uh, the Gendarmerie carbine bayonets actually have a slot in the handle for that clearing rod, uh, which was not included on the standard 1892 bayonets. So to take it off we're just going to push that button in, and then push the bayonet forward. Well. Hopefully you guys learned something today about the 1892 carbines. Uh, this was a briefer episode because there's just not a whole lot to tell you about that. However, what we have here is the basis for a couple of different developments in French rifles, and we'll be following up on both of those. One of them is going to be the modification of 1916, which is a whole package of upgrades to the guns, uh, and the other is what would eventually lead to the Berthier long rifle. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that at this point, 1892, even with the beginning of World War I, the French did not have a long rifle version of the Berthier. Uh, they had the, the infantry long rifle was the Lebel, and the cavalry for all of the other types of troops was the three-round uh, Berthier carbine. So 
Uh, we will follow this into the Indochina and the Senegalese 1902 and 1907 versions, and from there they will finally make it into the infantry long rifle version of the Berthier. So stick around for those videos as well, they will be coming up. If you are a fan of French rifles, don't miss your chance to get the cool Only Dropped Ones shirt. This is a limited edition shirt, it is only available until July 28th, so take a look at the link in the description text below to pick up one of those if you are so inclined. And of course, thank you for watching.